Well, hello, beloved. I hope that everyone is doing well tonight. Glad to see all of you on here. Um, if you have any prayer requests, go ahead and share those in the chat. We'll get started right away. Uh, I see Sister Brenda and uh, Sister Vicki and Sister Shirley and uh, other Sister Vicki. I'm not sure uh, which one of you is Sister Vicky and which one of you is other Sister Vicky. So you need to straighten that out between yourselves. And Sister Margaret here as well. Well, as you're tuning in, uh, let, let me know what prayer requests you have and we will get rolling with those. Um, let me tell you what I know. Sister Esther Rainey's home from the hospital, got home Saturday. I think I mentioned that on Sunday. Uh, but continue to pray for her. They're coming and giving her IV antibiotics to help with uh, the infection that she had. So continue to pray for her. Um, continue to pray for Sister Maria Robles continuing to recover. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Susan has some tests coming up. And I guess the insurance inspector came today. Is that right, Sister Susan? I hope they said, here, take all of our money. Um, Isaiah Royal is home and is doing well uh, after having his pacemaker put in. So we're grateful to God for that. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, my grandpa Jake, continue to pray for him. He is uh, uh, declining, so we certainly want to uh, be in prayer for him and his family. Uh, good to see you, Sister Linda. The, uh, we are the Vicky squared. Well, that's, that's good. To the second power. 
That's a whole lot of Vickies. Um, Sister Margaret, his brother had a 95% blockage and received a stent. Continued prayers for healing. Yes, I meant to mention that too. Uh, we are grateful they were able to get in there and, and do that. Uh, not have to do a bypass or anything. So that was good news. Uh, brother Andy Huff is having this uh, oral surgery tomorrow. He is... Um, because of the uh, accident he had several years ago, he was very sick, uh, been on some antibiotics and stuff that just ruined his teeth, and so they're actually taking out all of his top teeth, and then we'll have to go back and take out all of his bottom teeth later. So uh, be in prayer for him. It's going to be some pretty extensive recovery. And Sister Shirley Huff, uh, they are going to have to repipe the whole well um, because the the break is under the driveway. And so be in prayer for her. Uh, I know she mentioned that Sister Monica is increasing the rent daily. So, uh, yes, uh, Brother Paul's granddaughter. Um, oh my goodness. Haley is uh, doing better, I think. Last I heard from him, she's not running a fever anymore. So I don't know that they ever figured out what happened, but we are grateful for that. Uh, but do continue to pray for her. Hopefully they'll be able to get some answers about what's going on. If uh, you have anything to add, Brother Paul, please let me know. Okay, uh, Stilinda says, uh, as stated before in December, I had back surgery February 10th. A Texas Pride garbage truck hit me, not my fault, and messed up my back again. Please keep me in your prayers. So we certainly do want to be in prayer for you as you recover from that. Um, and sorry to hear about that. We uh, pray that you get full full strength and get uh, pain relief, get, get what you need. Uh, Brother John says, former co-worker's husband Dave is battling ALS and has experienced a rapid decline in the last few days. Uh, so want to be in prayer for uh, Dave and his family as well. Let me mention two... Um, oh, I lost it. I can't remember. I'm sorry. The... Let me give you a couple of announcements while we wait to see if any more prayer requests come in. Uh, we do have quite a lot of Easter candy, but we could certainly use some more. And so if you have any Easter candy, then please send that in. If you are retired or are not working Monday or Tuesday, the Texas Mission Builders who built our worship center are putting on a new roof at Creekmont. They're volunteer laborers that go from place to place and do work for churches at cost. Um, and so they're at Creekmont in Laporte. If you would like to come and help, uh, they have breakfast about 6.30. Um, and so they start working about 7 or 7.30. And uh, you, they can definitely find something for you to do to help. And it's always great to be able to help the organization that saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so uh, please, you know, if you're available, please consider going over there. Uh, let me know if you'd like to go together or if you need further information. But if you just, in your GPS, put Creekmont Baptist Church Laporte, uh, then it'll it'll take you over there. It's pretty easy to find right off the main drag. So uh, they are re-roofing it there. They did the first half last week, but they'll be there a couple more weeks because what they have left to do are the parts with the holes and the vents and all that kind of stuff that will take a little bit longer. But the more help they have, the quicker and the easier it goes. So, And the weather's beautiful right now, so it's a crime to be inside. Um, let's see. We, so if you want to help with that, that would be fantastic. Um, the TBI starts tomorrow night, and we, are, we didn't have anybody sign up for Life of Christ, so I'm just going to be teaching Manners and Customs. And that will be from 6 to 7.30. Uh, so if you are interested in that, it'll be in the old sanctuary and the educational building. And uh, we'd love to have you. If you haven't registered yet, just come and check it out tomorrow. And we'd love to have you. If you're not able to be there in person tomorrow, but you could watch from home, 
then tag me and I will send you a, a Zoom link where you can watch tomorrow as kind of a sample of the class and see what you think. And if you are interested in continuing it, it's uh, $75 for the class. If you're a member of the church, you can do that for credit um, or you can take it and audit it. It's also $75. So uh, please you know, consider that if you're going to be available. We've got a pretty good group signed up for this one. If you are interested, the let me just uh, give you a little commercial for it. The syllabus which I have put together for this class, let me drop my video. So week one, we'll do introduction to the biblical world, uh, geography, and the major kind of relevant historical empires during the biblical period. Um, in the uh, second week, we'll talk about marriage. Uh, so to place it, we're, the way I've organized this course, it's kind of different, but I, it was I just as an idea that I had that I wanted to try, is through the life of a person. And so it begins with kind of situating you in the world based on wherever somebody could have been born. And then you're beginning with their marriage. Um, uh, so a discussion of romantic and platonic relationships, virginity, adultery, engagement, and marriage, as well as a bride's dowry, some of that kind of stuff. And we'll, we'll go through all that. In uh, the third week, we'll talk about homes, uh, tents, multifamily homes, how they lived together in cities, palaces, property rights, uh, things like gleaning, uh, villages and cities, how their, you know, how their daily life. So you've got this couple, uh, they're born into this world, they've been married, and now where do they live? Just what are the basic things in their, in their life look like? And uh, the duty of hospitality is something really important. We'll get to do some cool stuff in this, like what kind of furniture did they have in Bible times, and how did they lock their doors, and stuff like that. Uh, that'll be interesting as well. Uh, lesson four, building a family. So now this couple that's been married and is in this home is going to have a child, and so we'll talk about the customs that go around pregnancy and naming children, the roles of parents, and then citizenship and adoption, uh, which are really important too. Um, so we, we'll go through weaning and uh, just how, what, what was it like to have a baby in ancient times? And how does that help us to understand things in the Bible, like Samuel being dedicated uh, to God or Moses being raised by Pharaoh's daughter? And so this will help bring the Bible to life. Uh, chapter, lesson five, commitments. So when a baby boy, we're going to pretend they had a baby boy, was eight days old, he would be circumcised. And so I'm going to use that as a jumping off point to talk about covenants and contracts and the law. So we'll talk about what police and prisons were like at different times in the ancient world. We'll talk about uh, just how they made their vows and these contracts and what, what law was like compared to today. Uh, then in week six, we'll do daily life. So we'll talk about what did they eat. Um, we'll talk about their bathing and <laughs> about cosmetics and uh, dentistry. We'll talk about the education of kids. We'll, we'll talk about th things like perfume and laundry and glasses. Is, what did daily life look like? And that'll provide us some insight too into some important biblical passages that maybe you wouldn't even think about uh, that I think will be good. Uh, lesson seven, going to work. So we'll look at tending sheep, grapes, olives, grain, metallurgy, and carpentry, as well as gleaning the rights of the poor and indigent to work and uh, get the food from the corners of the fields. We'll talk about winnowing and how they made their food fit to eat. We'll talk about bellows and furnaces and metal purifying. And again, there's lots of biblical passages that just sort of assume you already know. So Gideon, or um, when uh, Jeremiah goes to the potter's house, or when Peter says, your faith, which like gold is refined with, which more precious than gold, though refined with fire that kind of background. Uh, so we have your daily life. Now we've got the stuff that pays for your daily life. Lesson eight, we got money. Um, and so that's what you get from working. So we'll talk about they how they 
the coins they had, bartering, um, debts, beggars, taxes, slavery. This is one that's going to be pretty packed, even though it doesn't look like it, because this changes over the period from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Um, so we, we've kind of followed your life. Again, you're born into this world, you get married, you have a home, you build a family in your home, you have the, you know, the dedication of your child and the laws that you live under. You've got your daily life, you've got your work, you've got your finances. Uh, but then in lesson nine, we deal with how things go wrong. Uh, so we'll talk about divorce, uh, blood vengeance when someone was murdered, um, and war. We'll talk about how they waged war, military technology, all, all those kinds of things. Um, this one I, I have put in the syllabus. It'll be a relatively short lesson to give time to catch up on anything we didn't cover here because we're three quarters of the way through the course. Uh, week 10, we'll do the fun side of life, so the kind of opposite of the fallen world. Music, art, dance, athletics, holidays. Uh, we'll, we'll work through what that was like in the biblical time period, which... This one has some relevance, like when in the, the sacred music of the Psalms or when uh, Herod's uh, daughter-in-law dances before him for the head of John the Baptist and stuff. It'll have some implications for some of the metaphors, like Paul uh, comparing himself to an athlete that competes according to the rules so he can win the prize. Um, lesson 11 then will be religious backgrounds, uh, pagan gods, kind of who are Baal and Asherah and all those, and then some of the Greek gods, and how does that play into the New Testament? We'll actually see one instance of that tonight in Revelation, um, plus stuff like the Sabbath that we didn't have a chance to look at before, and uh, Sadducees and Pharisees and Essenes and all those Jewish religious groups. So we'll this one didn't really fit anywhere in kind of trying to do a trajectory of a life. Then lesson 12, it's only a 12-week course, uh, to be 13, but one week's off for spring break. Um, the end of the line. So we'll talk about sickness and doctors and uh, how did they treat the elderly? What was death like? Uh, what was burial like? How did inheritance work? And so we have followed this person from kind of their beginning, to their marriage, to their home, to the birth of their children, to their work, through their daily lives, now finally to their death, where their children will inherit their goods. Um, as you see by looking at the bibliography of the books that I referenced, I have worked my tail off preparing this course, and so I really hope that you will come and check it out. So if that sounds interesting to you, if it sounds like the kind of thing that would help you to understand the Bible better, uh, and to kind of bring the Bible to life for you, then just show up Thursday, uh, 6 to 7.30, and I would be happy to have you involved. So uh, sorry for that extended infomercial, uh, but I hope that that kind of shows you some of the stuff that we're looking at. I think we've got about 10 people that are enrolled, um, and so I'm I'm excited. I think it's going to be a great class. Uh, the One of the textbooks is the Baker Illustrated Guide to Everyday Life in Bible Times, which is a, it's got color pictures and little dictionary entries about different things. And the other one is a book, uh, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. Uh, that's a, an interesting book that the won't be, will be a book review. So the, the book review will be a fairly simple book. Um, reflection, five pages double-spaced on where do, what does the book get right and what does the book to push too far and get wrong. It, it'll be good. So it's not a whole terrible lot of work outside of class. Uh, there's a quiz each week that'll be five or ten questions. The lowest one will be dropped. Uh, book review, midterm, and a final. So uh, I, if you're interested, I, I think it'll be a really fun class. When we do some of the food stuff, I'm gonna to try to bring some stuff. When we do the lighting one, if I can let him, if he'll let me borrow it. Uh, when Colleen and I went on our honeymoon, we got Dad an oil lamp in Israel, uh, like a, a first century oil lamp, and uh, so I'd like to bring that in and kind of show you what that was like. And uh, you know, they, the archaeologists have discovered a lot of them. It wasn't like five thousand dollars or anything, <laughs> because they were so common and. Anyway, I, I just think that we'll be able to do some neat stuff in this class, 
And I think that even though it's not as hard as some of the other classes that we've done, like New Testament survey or Old Testament survey, or uh, you know, if we do a specific class on a book, I really think that it'll help bring the Bible to life for you. That when you're reading it, you'll realize that these are real people living in ways that you'll just understand a little better. And so it may not, it, it won't fundamentally rock your theology and think, oh, you know, I had this passage completely wrong because I didn't know that this is how they sat at the dinner table. But when you read it, I, I think that it'll just make everything a little bit more vivid and help you stay a little more engaged with Scripture and through Scripture with the author. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, let me know. But otherwise, just show up, six, uh, text me or email me if you want to get a Zoom link to sit in virtually. And this week, you can still sign up. Uh, it'd be hard to sign up after that because the class is only 12 weeks long and only an hour and a half each time. So it is going to be pretty packed. So anyway, uh, hopefully that was helpful and interesting to you. All right, so now let me just look at my phone and make sure that nobody has sent me anything else. Doesn't look like it. Um, so I think we are a-okay. All right, if there are no other prayer requests, then we will pray and push on. So Easter, uh, when you come to church on Sunday, the Sister Jebby has put the Vacation Bible School sign-up stuff in the foyer. And so this is a little bit earlier than we would normally do, uh, but uh, she and I talked about it and really felt like, since we're not sure who is going to be willing and able to help this year that the sooner we can start planning for Vacation Bible School, the better. Uh, we're optimistic to have a very good Vacation Bible School this year. I'm sure most of you have seen that the uh, governor has lifted a lot of the restrictions, um, uh, although we still want to be careful, and uh, that the president has said that by the end of May, everyone who wants a vaccine should be able to get one, even yuppies like me. And so uh, you know, that combination of things, I think, that by the time that we have Vacation Bible School will be really good. I'll also tell you that with City Reach, uh, we've submitted our deposit and our registration form and everything. And we, between the adults like me and Sister Musi um, the, and, the, and Brother Todd, and the teenagers, we've got 11 people going on this mission trip in Arkansas. Uh, basically college age and high school age. And so I think that's going to be a lot of fun too. I'm really looking forward to that. All right. Um, let's go ahead and transition ourselves. We're in Revelation chapter 9 again. I looked uh, last week. We started on this uh, fifth trumpet, the first of the three woes. We're going to finish that briefly, and then we will look at the sixth trumpet, the second woe. And hopefully that will be helpful for you too. All right, um, so you have, we, we saw these demons released, and you remember that the, the sun was darkened by them, uh, that there, there's so many of them rising up out of the bottomless pit, out of hell where they've been chained. Uh, of course, we talked about this some on Sunday, and we'll talk about it some more tonight. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm having some kind of a day. The one of the wheels on my chair broke off, and I don't know how. I, it like got caught on the uh, mat underneath the chair. 
and it won't snap back in. Or rather, when you snap it back in, it just falls right back out, and so my chair is wobbly. And I've been trying to prop it up all day. Um, the these demons rise up, as we saw in First Peter chapter three on Sunday. Uh, the demons right now are partially restrained. We saw there's some in prison that we read about in 1 Peter and 2 Peter and Jude. And these demonic powers apparently were loosed since the flood, maybe? Um, at least. Uh, some of them from the flood. I, I mean, I certainly think it's possible that in Satan's original rebellion, uh, shortly after the creation, or shortly it's hard to talk about those kind of things at that phase but anyway uh, after the creation uh, Satan's rebellion it's possible some were enchained then and remained so uh, they forsook their first estate their, their proper position uh, some have been in prison since the days of Noah I, I think that we see that one of the questions that people often ask is why does God not defeat Satan right now? You know, why does God allow these demonic forces to continue to interact in the world? Uh, and that's a fair question. And I think we answered that when we saw the martyrs crying out, God, how long? And God said, a little bit longer. Be patient until the number of your brothers has been fulfilled. And then the things will be handled once and for all. Uh, but I think there's another question that maybe we wouldn't normally ask, but that this situation in Revelation 9 and that the uh, developments in First and Second Peter and Jude bring to mind. And that is, why hasn't God allowed the demons to have full reign? So we ask a lot of times, why does God allow them to continue existing at all or continue to work on the earth at all? And again, that is a good question, but it's not the whole question because, again, what we see here is that there are certain demonic influences that God is restraining even now, that there are certain demonic influences that God has stopped and that now in the tribulation period, he unleashes them. And so it's helpful for me, uh, although it's not a completely airtight analysis, uh, but it's helpful for, for me to think that the first seven judgments, the seals, seem to be God, for the most part, allowing humanity's sin to have its effect. So right now we know that by his common grace, God stops a lot, a lot of the wickedness that we would otherwise do. That even now, God does not allow human beings to be as evil as we would if we were totally unrestrained. Uh, we saw that in the Garden of Eden when they were cast out of the garden and God placed an angel at the gateway to the garden with a flaming sword to keep them from entering into the garden, to protect them from themselves lest they go in and take and live forever in their sinful state and never have the release of redemption. So God stopped them from that sin. In the life of Abraham, and then again in the life of Isaac, they went to a king named Abimelech, and in all likelihood it was Abimelech and then his son, also named Abimelech, and Abraham said, this is my sister uh, with Sarah because he was afraid that they would kill him to marry her if they knew that he was her, he was her husband. Well, uh, when, uh, him, when Abimelech found out, God said to him in a dream, I've kept you from touching her to protect you from judgment. And uh, the same thing happened with his son, with Isaac and Rebekah. He did the same thing as his father. There's probably uh, an interesting sermon to be written about that. But you understand what I'm saying, that God often keeps us from sinning as much as we would, even lost people, much less saved people. God restrains the evil that we're capable of. But when we read the first seven sealed judgments, 
it certainly seems like those restraints are largely lifted. There's war, and there's famine that only affects the poor and middle classes, and there's death. There's these things that are unleashed. And again, it's not perfect. It's not that everything in the seven trumpets, in the seven seals, excuse me, is linked to that, but there does seem to be a pattern. Now, the seven trumpets get more active from God, and but here it seems largely like you have the demonic forces allowed to have their day. So in the seven tr seals, you have the human forces allowed to have their way. In the seven trumpets, you have the demonic forces. And so there's this escalation, this upward spiral that we keep talking about where things are getting more and more intense. And then in the seven bowls, those are the wrath of God poured out. And so in the seven bowls or seven vials, you no longer have God allowing demons to have what they want or allowing humans to have what they want, but now God is pouring out his wrath. And you notice if you work out any kind of a chronology that the bowls of wrath take up a very brief time, and we know why. Uh, Jesus says that if the days, if those days were not shortened, uh, then no flesh would survive. That is that once God begins to actively judge the world, no one would survive that for very long. So we see this kind of gradual escalation up the stairway. You have humanity and then angels and then God himself as these, these forces are unleashed. And so I think that's a helpful way of thinking about it. And it's helpful because that happens in your own life sometimes. We read about it in Romans 1. God gave them over to a depraved mind that you resist and resist and resist but like Pharaoh, and of course Exodus is always just beneath the surface in Revelation, like Pharaoh, eventually God says, okay, have it your way. I will confirm you in the hardening of your heart. And so I think that is certainly what is happening here. So the, the, we're, we're going to see at the end of the second woe that those that survived still worshiped their idols. And we know from 1 Corinthians that P, uh, Paul says that those who worship idols, those don't worship idols, they worship the demons behind the idols. And so in that sense, they continue in their idolatry until now God says, okay, have it your way. These are the gods you want. I will release them so that you can have them. And I think that if you read Revelation through that lens, it's a very helpful way of visualizing what's going on. So you have these locusts released, and there came out of the earth, out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So we see that only those that are not, that don't have the name of God, the seal of God on their foreheads are tormented here. And we saw that in the Exodus too, that in many of the plagues, the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were, was spared most supremely in the Passover. And remember, we saw that um, in the letters to the churches that Jesus promised to the overcomers to write his name on them, the name of his father. And so these are the saved. The saved are spared, and the lost, those that dwell upon the earth, are tormented for five months. They're not killed. They're, they're tormented. Now, what's interesting here is, aside from this description, which, again, we have to remember that trying to force this description into a physical box is to miss the point. Uh, and, and some people look at that and say, well, you, you know, you're trying to spiritualize it away. No, I'm saying that what the reality is much worse. I'm saying that we, if we uh, believe what the Bible says, then we'll believe that there are angelic powers that are behind nations and angels operating in churches, and that when Israel was destroyed, when Jerusalem uh, was sacked by the Babylonians, that at that same time, the angels were slaughtering. And again, there were human beings there that were actors 
and, and yet at the same time, the Bible explicitly says that he sent his angel in that was killing. And, and so we have to come to terms as much as we can with this two-tiered reality. And it seems to me that even Christians want to kind of get around this. So when you see locusts and everything and the, these demonic forces that fill up the sky, uh, we want to look at it. Oftentimes people want to say, well, those are really helicopters. And that's just John trying to explain what a helicopter was. And I, I'm going to push back pretty hard on that because I'm going to say that even if there are helicopters or whatever involved in these judgments, that's not John's point. John's point by saying they come up out of the bottomless pit, they come up out of the abyss, is that these are demonic forces being unleashed on the earth. Now, the demons that were responsible with the fall of Jerusalem were acting through men with swords. And I don't understand exactly how that works. But, and here, they may be acting through helicopters or whatever. I don't know. Uh, but I think that when we want to force it, when the Bible explicitly says that he sees this in symbols, and he's actually going to repeat that, before the second woe, that is the sixth trumpet, I think we should be really careful about the about not trying to surrender to the naturalism of our world. Our world's motto is that if there can be a physical explanation, that must be right. And so even Christians are oftentimes prone to say, well, you know, I'll only believe God did it if there's uh, no other possible explanation. And so even in Revelation, we read and we say, oh, you've got all these trumpets and the, these judgments and here are these flying things. And people seem to either say, well, there's a literal locust flying around, some kind of monstrous animal. Or people say, oh, well, this is a symbol for helicopters or whatever it may be. Uh, and in both cases, I think we're trying to make we, we are buying into the assumption of our culture that physical reality is all there is when the Bible makes very clear that there are two things going on, that we are already seated in the heavenly places in Christ, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and uh, spiritual wickedness in high places, that we are have weapons that are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds, that even though we can't understand it, and that people who get this obsessive interest with angels and demons and stuff like that seem to fall into an extreme trap too, that I think we should take some of this at face value. I think that when Revelation 1 through 3 say, to, sorry, 2 through 3 say to the angel of the church of whatever, right? I think that Unless we're given a good reason to think otherwise, we should believe that there's an angel that is behind that church, that uh, represents that church before God, like Michael represented Israel, or like Satan represented Tyre, and that we should see that there is this blend of physical and spiritual realities. Um, and so I think that, while I told you before, um, that the... Uh, sorry... <laughs> was me making a joke with the planning committee for church camp. Um, I, I, so while I think that, you know, this is designed not to be taken literally, as I said, but to show us a spiritual reality, you know, angels don't look like anything. They're spirits. They don't have bodies. Uh, but the different things in their description are designed to show us who they are. I think that we should take that as it comes. So let's go ahead and read very quickly, because um, I really want to do the second woe tonight. Uh, okay. So they, uh, they, they have torment like a scorpion. So this causes pain and not death. Okay. And, and the thing about causing pain and not death, I think, is that when you cause pain rather than death, there is a, um, there's still a chance to repent at least in theory. Now, by and large, people don't repent. And this is a big deal. And uh, when Jesus was talking about the rich man and Lazarus, he said that, you know, the rich man said, send Lazarus to go and warn my brothers. And Jesus said, no, if they won't listen to the law and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. 
If someone doesn't respond to the mercy and the grace of God, then torment won't get their attention either. And that's an important lesson God is teaching us here. He says, they'll be tormented five months. And uh, five months is important too. It's pain for a season, but not forever. And their torment was as a scorpion when he striketh a man. It's not going to kill you, but it's going to hurt you. They have these teeth that look ferocious, but their pain comes from behind. That's interesting too. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared for battle. Now here we have these idea of the horses as warriors, and the idea of locusts as um, attacking forces comes both from uh, the Exodus, but also from Joel 2. Joel is also frequently referenced in the uh, New Testament. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Hey, blow ye the trumpet, okay? Sound an alarm, let everybody know battle is coming. We saw that when we started out on the trumpets, and we discussed what trumpets represent. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spreads upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So he says, something's coming, a great and strong people, uh, that there's never been anything like it before. Now, people here, if you uh, pull this up, is like a family. Okay, so it's, it's actually not a, these are not people, these are not human beings in the way we would say people. Rather, uh, as we'll see, there's something much deeper going on. Uh, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Can you imagine this? Um, you've got a garden before them, and imagine like the the flamethrowers they use to kill weeds and stuff. Imagine a, a wall of fire that everything behind it is desolate. He said, this is what these people are like. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. And like and as horsemen, so shall they run. So what do, what's the symbol here of horses? It's that they're fast, that their judgment is speedy, that there's no chance to escape. And so uh, when we come here and we see, okay, horses, we're going to say swift, okay? Uh, we see this metaphor a lot or something like this metaphor a lot. The day of the Lord is as a thief in the night. So the fact they're horses tells us that they're swift. There's more. Uh, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Well, we saw that here too, didn't we? That they the the sound of their wings was the sound of many chariot of many of the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, and so what what's the symbolism here? Well, he doesn't explicitly tell us, but if you were an ancient Israelite, the sound of horses was the sound of judgment, the sound of danger. It is fear. Okay. So they're fearful, they're swift, they're painful. Going back now. Uh, and of course, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Okay, you've got, again, this sense of speed and inevitability. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array, before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. So they bring fear, they bring mourning, they bring pain. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall the one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path. So they don't break ranks, they don't push and shove one another, this army walks in perfect precision. Again, this is not a human army, right? This is a spiritual army. These are demons being unleashed that are coming and bringing destruction on the earth. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Okay, you can't hurt them. And we see that here. They had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. You can't fight back. Now, you said, you stop, you say, wait a minute, Justin. You said earlier that we have weapons mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. We've got the armor of God. And that's true. 
The people that are under attack from these demons, though, are lost people. They have no way to resist. They don't, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Word of God. They don't have the tools to resist because they have given themselves over to the worship of idols. These idols now have power over them, and it's too late to change their mind. It's like if you walk off a cliff, you have a choice right up until you take the step over the edge of the cliff, and then your choice has made your choice for you. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. They're going to get everywhere. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? You say, wait a minute. It says it's God's army. But then you were saying that it's, they're demons. So what, what, what are you saying with that, Justin? Well, let me tell you. Um, the, when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So these demons, and when, when Satan betrayed, when, and Satan entered into the heart of Judas to have Judas betray Jesus, that was an act of rebellion, and yet God in his sovereignty used it to accomplish the redemption of mankind. So they're God's army, and they're unleashed at the perfect time when their own sin and their own wickedness will allow them to fulfill the purpose that God has for them. There's some deep theology right there. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. This is one of my favorite verses. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and I will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things." So we, we could look more, and I, we will come back and talk about maybe when we read about these armies from the north and stuff, what, what could that mean the actual instrument of these demons is? But right now what I'm very interested in is, is this. God says, this judgment is coming. He says, therefore, turn your heart to me. Now at the end of the second woe, it says this. The... The, and the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. God says, turn to me with all your heart. Rend your heart, not your garments. You know, in those days when they were brokenhearted, when they were mourning, they would tear their clothes as a symbol of their grief. Spoiler alert for week 12 of our Manners and Customs class. They um, would, would, would tear, tear their garments. God says, I don't want you to tear your garments. I want you to tear your heart. These inhabitants of the earth, way back during the seals, had said to the mountains, fall on us, for the wrath of the Lamb is here. But they rendered their garments, not their hearts. They... They cried out in fear, but not in repentance. And so what we saw when he went further is he said, look, if you turn to God, he's gracious and merciful. He'll forgive and he'll give a blessing. Remember before it said Eden is before him and Eden is before them and disasters behind them. Here it says there'll be a blessing behind him. Something you could give back to worship him. 
He says, blow the trumpet in Zion. The same thing we saw at the beginning. Do you, do you see that? Remember when we studied the trumpets and I told you there were two big reasons for trumpets? There was for gathering for battle or warning people about an invasion. There was the military meaning and then there was the worship meaning. And I suggested that the seven trumpets in Revelation are kind of both. They kind of straddle the line. Here... At the beginning, he says, blow a trumpet in Zion because the enemy is coming and they're going to wipe you out. He says, but rend your hearts and not your garments. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly and I will forgive and I will send back the armies of the invaders and I'll give you peace. You see, he says, there's a trumpet coming and it will either be the trumpet of war and your destruction or the trumpet of assembling for worship. The difference is not in the sound. The difference is how you respond. If you respond with a broken heart or a proud face. So w w when we finish this out, let's let's look and you know. I, so a lot of what we read is made clear. Uh, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared for battle. So we saw that they're swift and dangerous. On their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. Um, so golden crowns, as we've seen repeatedly represent authority okay i'll put power that is to say that they have been given the uh, ability to carry out their mission okay they, they wear crowns of gold and their faces were as the faces of men so this is important okay they've got human they've got faces like humans okay there's a people like you've never seen before uh, but what that tells us is that these are intelligent, okay? This is not some unthinking animal plague where you say, well, they couldn't help it, like somebody's been mauled by a lion. No, these are intelligent forces that are coming and deliberately bringing torment. Uh, they had hair as the hair of women. Uh, some people say, based on some writings in the rabbis, that uh, hair like women was sometimes used as a link to the antennae of locusts. I don't know. I, I think that probably that is more closely linked, or the, this is more closely linked with the, um, the fact their horses and destruction is coming swiftly. That is that the hair is blowing back behind them. Uh, the Parthians, who were an enemy of the Romans at the time of Revelation's writing, famously had long blonde hair and came from the north and when they rode uh, they would let their hair flow free behind them to show that they were coming quickly uh, and I think this is probably likely of lions again uh, this links like the sound of the chariots to fear their lion's teeth are not what hurt they're to intimidate you they're to show you that these are ferocious and intelligent and they're coming quickly and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. They had tails like scorpions, inflicting pain, and their stings were in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Now, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, Abaddon means destruction, so this is, of course, uh, Satan himself, who is dominant. Uh, he, he's the king of the angels of the bottomless pit. He is not the ruler of hell, uh, but they they serve him. Now, what's really interesting, and I, I think a, a lot of people probably miss, is John gives Abaddon, the Hebrew name, and then he gives the Greek one, Apollyon. And, you know, sometimes you see that when uh, there's a translation to make something clear. Uh, and Abaddon is used of the grave and stuff in the Old Testament. So there's this strong background of death and destruction. But Apollyon, it's interesting that he uses that word. Uh, that's where the word, the, the Greek god Apollos, the Greek god of the sun, comes from. And so here, as we've talked about over and over again, when people worship idols, they're not worshiping idols. They're worshiping the demons that stand behind the idols. And so Apollyon, Apollos, he's saying that this powerful leading god of the Romans was really Satan himself commanding hordes of demons. 
uh, and that already these people were worshiping him rather than worshiping God. Uh, what's especially interesting is that the emperor, when Revelation was written, was Domitian, D-O-M-I-T-I-A-N. And he is the one who launched this major persecution against Christianity. He's the one that fed Christians to lions. He's the one that exiled John to Patmos. And he claimed that he was the human incarnation of Apollos. That same thing that Pharaoh claimed, that he was a god himself, was the claim of Apollyon, of Apollos, of Domitian. And so here John is, while he's describing these demons that come and bring judgment and that people can t they, they, they suffer, but that by and large suffering does not lead to repentance. It's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance, that they, the trumpet blows and rather than it being a trumpet of worship for them, it is a trumpet of war. He says that this is already begun. Okay. It, it, it says over and over again in Revelation, there's very rarely anything that's totally new. It's the culmination of what has been taking place throughout history. It's the, the, the culmination of the wickedness and the evil that we've brought on ourselves. And so Apollyon, Apollos, is represented here as, as Satan standing behind the Roman Empire. We know Satan stood behind Babylon and Tyre. Uh, it, it seems perhaps that the dominant wicked nation of a time period is ruled by Satan himself. You know, again, I don't want to get too into the weeds because I'm not entirely sure how all that plays out. I, I, I don't, we don't know. We, we just know that the angels were given authority over nations, uh, according to Psalms, uh, Psalm 80 and other places, and Psalm 90 maybe. Let me look that up and be, be sure. But we, we know it too that Michael was over Israel. And so here it seems that the king of the bottomless pit, the angel of the bottomless pit, the king of all these demons is linked closely with Apollos. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, first let's read verse 12. One woe is past and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Basically he says, you think this was bad. The worst is yet to come. He says there's, there's two more woes. Uh, Phillips, who did a kind of a paraphrase of the New Testament, it, uh, calling it a translation is a pretty generous thing. Uh, and sometimes it's very bad, but it's often vivid. <laughs> and uh, in, when he was translating this verse, he translated it, Behold, the first woe is past, and I see two more on the horizon. So again, as an accurate translation, it's, it's really not. But it captures the intensity of what we're looking at. It captures the force that the worst is yet to come. So that if we turn and repent, then God says, I'm going to bless and I'm going to restore. <laughs> and this army that he sent, that he unleashed, will be restrained. And he'll, he'll bring peace. And it's, it, but he says both will happen. He says it'll come to pass that the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So in some sense, this is not even the great and terrible day of the Lord yet. It's not the ultimate judgment. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. This is, of course, quoted by Peter in Acts 2. It's quoted here. Uh, it's, it's ref, uh, Joel 2 is referenced here. And it is mentioned that there will be a trumpet that will be a trumpet of judgment. But then later there will be a, a trumpet that will be the gathering of his people. And, and so I hope that it is sufficiently clear to you. I lost my... I must have... Kicked in. Okay, there we go. Um, I hope it's sufficiently clear to you what we're looking at, that judgment does not bring 
repentance. That the kindness of God leads to repentance. That if you won't respond to God now, you won't respond to God ever. So blow the trumpet in Zion. Call a solemn feast. Rend your heart and not your garment. If we repent of our sin now, rather than serving the idols of this world, you may say, well, you know, I've got these different priorities. I've got a lot of things competing for my attention. I'm truly torn. Well, the... <laughs> If you're, if you're serving Apollyon, if you're serving the thing that only leads to destruction, if you're serving the, the idols of this world, although we don't often worship things that are made of gold and silver with faces and names, we you may worship gold and silver directly. Don't bother carving it into anything. You, you, you may worship reputation or money or power or whatever. Since you're really worshiping the king of the demons of the bottomless pit. And all he has to offer you is the bottomless pit to be tormented alongside him. I know, I said we were going to get the next woe. But we didn't. I apologize for that. So just pretend that I didn't say that. Next week, uh, we will look at the sixth angel. Um, and we'll see the this judgment that's even worse. And then in uh, chapter 10, we'll get into some really interesting stuff with this book and the judgments. And it, it'll be a while before we get to the seventh trumpet uh, because there's an interlude, as we talked about before. There's an interlude between the sixth and seventh judgment in each set that breaks the chronology and takes you back and gives you the big picture. So if you have any questions, then go ahead and ask those, and I will do my best to answer them. I don't know how much delay we've got tonight. If you don't have any questions and you think, wow, that was really complicated, uh, but I understand it a little bit better now, then like and share this video and have your friends watch it too. Um, otherwise, we'll close with a word of prayer. And if there are any questions when I finish praying, I'll answer them. And if not, then we will call it a night. Heavenly Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the blessings that you give us. I thank you that you give us all ample space to repent, that we, we're not doomed to the judgment that we deserve, but if we'll come and rend our hearts and not our garments, come in real repentance to your son Jesus, that to his tenderness and his mercy and his grace will be drawn, that we can be spared our judgment. And Father, I just hope that you'll help us to remember that if we don't respond to mercy, then judgment only hardens us more in that the truth is that the difference is not in what happens, but how we respond to it. So I pray, Father, that as we read this terrifying description of judgment, that we would see that we can be spared from it if we'll turn to you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, beloved, we will see you on Sunday morning here in person because the sprinkler's fixed. I think I said that Sunday night. Um, and if you have any questions or anything else you need, then please do not hesitate to let me know. Uh, but otherwise, I will see you Sunday.
Christmas.